Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. And this completes the politically correct portion of my presentation today. From this point on, it may well be that I'm going to venture into territory that is completely politically incorrect. In fact, I have every intention to do so. What I am about to tell you next is in fact not only politically incorrect at, at many universities, in fact, I would judge at the universities where about 98 or 99 percent of American students attend, what I am about to tell you would re be regarded as a social blunder, as some kind of a faux pas, sort of as if I had come to the meeting without my shirt on. And I promise you that would have been a terrible faux pas. <laughs> In fact, if I were the president of Colorado uh, University, or of the University of Northern Colorado, or of CSU, and I invited a group of faculty and staff members to come together and said to them what I am about to say to you, I'd be heavily criticized. And in fact, I might be investigated by a committee of the state legislature. I might even be sued by the American Civil Liberties Union. What is it that I am about to say to you? I'm going to say to you, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. I have now mentioned Jesus more times in five seconds than his name will be mentioned in primetime television in a year or two. I have mentioned the name of Jesus more times in a few seconds than his name will be mentioned in the pages of the Rocky Mountain News or the Denver Post. It is completely, completely politically incorrect. And not only am I going to say that to you, I'm going to ask you to join me in this counter-culture point of view. Chuck King, who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus. Ron Benton, where are you? Back here. Ron, who is the, the way, the truth, and the life? Jesus. Can anybody tell me who is the light of the world? Maxine? Jesus. Jesus. Exactly. What is the one name given among the members of the human race by which we must be saved? Jesus. 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 Join me. Jesus. 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 Thank you very, very much. If we were at the University of Colorado, CSU, or one of those, we would all lose our jobs presently. Happily, that's not going to happen to us here. We are gathered in the name and the spirit of Jesus Christ, but we are a counterculture movement today. How many of you have ever been terribly cold? Have you ever been so cold that, the, that, the, that the, the, the cold just seeped into your bones and you could feel it in the marrow of your bones and your, your blood ran cold and it just was, it was freezing and, and depressing? Has anybody ever had that experience? Okay, now we know who goes to the late season Bronco games. <laughs> I want to tell you about a couple that had that experience. They, uh, they lived up in Minnesota. Is there anybody here from Minnesota who's ever lived up in Minnesota through the winter? Gail, how cold do you think it got in the winter in Minnesota? What's the coldest you ever? How much? Did you ever see 25 below? Yeah, lots of times. I used to live up there. It can be terribly cold. Wonderful place. Summers are glorious. Winters are just, you can't believe how cold it is. Well, I want to tell you about a couple who lived up in Minnesota, and who in about February just realized they had to do something. It was just too cold. They had to get away. They had to get warmed up. They had to get to where there was some sunshine. And so they agreed among themselves that they would meet in Orlando, Florida. The husband had to make a side trip. He had to go to Chicago, and then was going to fly down, and then his wife was going to fly down to meet him in Orlando, and that's what they did. So the husband went off on his business trip. They had agreed to meet a day or two later in Orlando. He went to Chicago. Uh, there was a little uh, problem at the airport. The plane to Orlando was canceled, and he ended up having to go to Miami instead of Orlando. So when he got there and got checked into the hotel, he sent his wife an email. But as luck would have it, the email was misdirected. He, in, in the address, he, he put in one wrong letter, and so the email went to a different person. He expected it to go to his wife, but it went to somebody exactly different. And in fact, by a twist of fate, it went to a person, to a woman, whose husband had passed away the day before. 
She was up in, in, in the bedroom of their home, grieving. Her children were downstairs in the living room, uh, entertaining the guests who had come to express their condolences. And suddenly, as the children were doing that, they heard a, a thud, the sound of, of a, a heavy object hitting the floor. And they went up, running up the stairs. And sure enough, here was their mother laying on the floor. And on her desk was her computer. And on the screen was an email which said, Beloved wife, departed yesterday, as you recall. <laughs> had a little problem at the gate, and so I didn't get to go where I had planned. I've received confirmation that you'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> Your loving husband. P.S. You're not going to believe how hot it is down here. <laughs> Mistakes will happen and misunderstandings will happen, but I'm going to tell you one thing about which in my heart there is no misunderstanding. I must have the greatest job in the world. After about 55 weeks as the president of Colorado Christian University, I am more convinced than I have ever been that God has great, great plans for CCU. It is the most energizing, most exciting, it is actually the most exhilarating thing I have ever been involved in. And before we get down to serious business this morning, I want to say to all of you how much I appreciate your friendship, the encouragement you've given me, the way you have answered my questions, sometimes even before I knew that I was supposed to ask a question for the, uh, well, I, I just, I, I admire you all for your professional ability, for your integrity, particularly for the love that you show for our students and the fact that you're doing it all for Jesus Christ. I admire your joie de vie, your faithful testimony, and your service are an inspiration to me. May God bless you for all you do for CCU. I am honored to be part of this with you. Well, as you know, our theme verse comes from the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Father, we do claim this promise. We pray that this will be the favorable year of the Lord. The academic year just began, the fiscal year that began on July 1st. We pray for your favor. And you know, it is clear, amen, it is clear to me that God is in the process of showing in very interesting and unusual and remarkable ways his favor. All I can say about WOW Weekend is wow. Was that fun? How many were there to see the students move in, to see them carry their stuff up the stairs? Wasn't it a great time? You know, before I came to CCU, I couldn't quite figure out why everybody was so excited about the day the students returned, but it is, it, it's remarkable. All year long in my office, which, which looks out on the, uh, on the uh, quadrangle, on the grass, it, it was as if the university was in a state of suspended animation and then here came the students back on WOW weekend and it was really terrific. <laughs> We'd like to have a faculty group that would care to participate in this activity <laughs> as well. WOW weekend. Here's what one of the mothers wrote to me. Our family recently attended the WOW weekend, and I want to congratulate you and all the staff and students who had a hand in putting it all together. What a tremendous undertaking. She's not wrong about that. And you made it look easy. Thanks for making our family feel so welcome. You did a fabulous job. And all I can say is congratulations to Jim McCormick and his team and to 170 student volunteers that put all that together. Great, great comments about call to community. Here's a guy that needs to lose a few pounds. In fact, I have been wondering, I can't remember what I was saying when I made that gesture. Was it, what do you think I got in here or exactly <laughs> what it was? But it was, it was a wonderful occasion. Those of you who were there will remember how good it was. This, this, by the way, this is my favorite activity of the year. When the students come racing out of the north door of the events center, and discover their fellow students out there waiting to welcome them. And then uh, if you weren't there, I must tell you that uh, when, when Steve Taylor and Jenny finished singing, 
I turned to whomever it was that I was seated next to and said, and I really meant it, Steve, are you in the room? Oh, your no, his name starts with T. He'll be here this afternoon. I said, this is the most beautiful thing I have ever heard. And it really was. It was just gorgeous. It was a wonderful moment. <coughs> Chapel services, off to a great start. Uh, some of you were there to see uh, Marissa Boyer introduce her dad. It was a, a wonderful moment. And then Pastor Boyer, Pastor Keith Boyer, got up and gave a great message. And he summed it up all by saying, CCU rocks to the glory of God. Two great freshman chapels with uh, Larry Crabb. Uh, and Scott, what was it that you said about those, that they were off the charts or some word to that, that, general, uh, that general thought and point of view? I am very happy to tell you that even as we speak, Dr. Larry Crabb is in the process of folding, spindling, and mutilating his travel and speaking and seminar schedule so that he can be more available to us at the university, more visible in our classrooms, a great opportunity for our students, and of course, a great opportunity for uh, CCU, an honor to our university. The new student retreat, I am told, was nothing short of fabulous, 388 students. Scott spoke on the subject of compassion, uh, no, I'm sorry, of passion and calling, and he spoke with a sense of passion. He also may have said a word about some other things, maybe about basketball, swimming, the zip line. But you know the, the bottom line, though a lot of fun, a lot of hijinks, a lot of great things, but uh, in the end, this was all about Jesus. A lot of quiet time, a lot of moments of reflection. One transfer student told that she was uh, aware at her former school that uh, she just wasn't close enough to God, that actually her former school was pulling her away from God. And here's what she said, quote, I need to be a, in a place, I need to be in a place where I am exhorted in my faith, and don't we all? What I say to parents as they bring their prospective students here is that at CCU, you do not have to make an appointment to meet Jesus. He is in every classroom, he is in every place. Another student said of her former university, I never felt so far away from God. If you would like to be encouraged in your own faith, your faith in Christ and your faith in this university, I would just say go see Jim McCormick, sidle up to him and get him to tell you some of the stories. I've just related a couple of them, but he's got a foot locker, foot locker full of stories that will really make you feel good about what we are, are doing here. All of us pray for our students every day, especially for those that have special needs. Well, a lot of good news around campus. Rave reviews for the uh, Life Development Center. Three cheers for the staff. How many from LDC in the room this morning? Well, stand up. <laughs> All right, now here's something to praise the Lord about. We had a balanced budget. In fact, we were in the black for the year 2006, 2007. Our new phone system is up and running and is it now working perfectly, Brian? Almost perfectly. <laughs> this is going to be great because, uh, and I know we've been through a few, there have been a few kinks in the system getting it started. It is going to give us much better telephone capability, and it's going to save money in the process of doing it. The new academic conference room, if you haven't been over to see Sherry's new conference room, this is the nicest physical space on the campus. And next door to it is the new writing lab. More about that in a minute. Uh, we've got a new debate, debate program starting, a new TV production program starting. Each of those one credit courses at the moment. The School of Music, 61 majors this year, up 22% from last year. Uh, in uh, January, the School of Music will offer a winter term week in uh, New York City to take students back to go to the Big Apple for musical shows, museums, and from what I've already heard about the program, sounds like something I'd like to go on myself. It's going to be wonderful. And then I think in February, there is the prospect or possibility that some of our students will be singing at Carnegie Hall. So it's going to be an exciting year. School of Music graduates are now working full time in the music ministries of Waterstone Community Church, Lookout Mountain Church, Flatirons, Foothills, Cherry Hills, and many, many others. 
Meantime, the uh, School of Theology uh, graduates uh, are uh, going to Duke Divinity School, Wheaton Graduate School, Vanderbilt, Aberdeen, Calvin Theological Seminary. And it is wonderful if you look at what our graduates are doing in their professional life today. I spent an hour a while back with Robert Gelinas, a graduate of CCU. He is now the senior pastor of a huge church here in the Denver area, uh, Colorado Community Church. It's a mega church. He's just doing remarkable things. Uh, Stace Tafoya is the head of uh, Epiphany Episcopal, a conservative Anglican congregation. Dr. Brian Bach, a graduate of CCU's with a Bib Studies major, is teaching at the University of Aberdeen. I had lunch the other day. Uh, Kevin took me over to have lunch with Greg Steyer of Dare to Share. How many of you are aware of that ministry? We've got to get that guy over here on campus. He is, uh, as I listened to him, he reminded me exactly of a young Bill Bright. He's got so much vision and so much energy and so much enthusiasm. Meantime, speaking of enthusiasm, the School of Business and Leadership. Chuck King is uh, in the process of reviewing the curriculum from top to bottom. They're getting ready for another VALS conference, and we hope it's going to be as successful as the one in 2007. And they're using the new Turning Point Response System, which I think is the cat's meow. I don't know, most of you I'm sure have seen it. I think that is a wonderful, wonderful tool. And every day I see new uh, academic research that indicates the use of that kind of technique will have a dramatic effect on the learning environment for our students. School of Music, whoops, School of Education, I beg your pardon. 92 elementary education majors, 67 secondary education majors. Right now, 89 of our students are out in the uh, public schools for their field experience or student teaching. 159 students in the School of Music altogether. They're really on a, on a roll. And uh, I'll say the same thing uh, about Sarah Dahlman that I said a moment ago about Jim McCormick. If you want to be encouraged, uh, go ask Sarah to let you just look at some of the letters that she has received from some of our graduates. Speaking of graduates, CCU psychology majors are being accepted into top flight grad schools and disciplines including social psychology, criminal justice, criminal, clinical psychology, theology, social work, and nurses. If you heard a whoop a few days ago coming out of my office, it's when I learned about the results of the praxis, uh, a nationwide test of education English majors. Of our students who took this test, 63% ended up in the top 15% nationally. Now, Wendy Petrie, who has a way with words, summed it up. That is pretty cool. Well, well, well said, Wendy. That is pretty cool. The library is humming. Now open uh, seven days a week, 88 hours a week. I think the campus looks great, and uh, I want to say a special word of thanks to all of you who took part in the Day of Caring. I think about 70 members of the faculty and staff and students turned out to plant flowers, 900 of them, and do some other things that really does make the place look great. Thanks, too, to Will and John for the care they give for the, uh, for the campus and for being a friend to all of us, and to Harry and his team for keeping the campus safe. The campus looks great, with the exception of. <laughs> we, we are toying with the idea. We're considering the idea of asking the uh, National Science Institute to declare this a, a mold research <laughs> center. Now, I want to I, I tell you why, nestled in the heart <laughs> Pond scum is beautiful, but I want to tell you why this has not been uh, made to look as we would like it to look. I, I called Ron uh, Benton a, a few days ago, and I said, well, now Ron, I don't know if you've noticed, but, the, but, but uh, the lake doesn't look just as good as we'd like it to. <laughs> he says, well, I know that. And I said, well, could we do anything about it? And he says, no, absolutely not. Now, here's an example of your government at work. It turns out that we can't do much with that. I mean, we can't plant <laughs> trees or bushes or shrubs or flowers or install a sprinkler system or any of that until the Corps of Engineers has signed off on the project. 
And they won't do that until the city of Lakewood has signed off on the project. Lakewood has not done that. And once Lakewood signs off, or maybe they have in the last few days, but th did they finally sign off? They finally signed off. Okay, so now we've got just one more year to go. That's right. It takes a year. After Lakewood signs off, it takes another year before they will, they will uh, let us go ahead and, and start making it look like what we would like to do. I just wanted to say that so that you wouldn't think that somehow somebody had a log in their eye and couldn't see that it didn't look exactly the way we wanted to. And I asked, I asked Ron, I said, well, what is it that they think would go wrong if we put in a, a sprinkler system and, and some grass and some flowers, and he says, well, they're afraid if a pipe breaks that it might, uh, it might undermine the structural integrity of the dam. And I said, well, wait a minute. This dam has been designed to withstand a 100-year flood. And they're telling us that if a pipe breaks, we're going to have a problem. But all I can tell you is it is what it is. It's going to get better as soon as we can. Three cheers for Service Central. Yes. We're not there yet, but we are right on the brink of doing something great in Service Central. Um, I, I don't know whether it's right to say we're 75% there, 65% there, 85% there. Can I assure everyone in the room that that will be done by October 1st of some future year? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> CAGS is on a roll. Dick Crombie has uh, reorganized his team, uh, aiming for excellence academically, uh, in terms of spiritual development, and in terms of enrollment growth. Uh, under the leadership of Mike Maroney, we have new vitality in our, uh, in our centers in Grand Junction and Loveland and Colorado Springs. And uh, I would like to announce to you this morning our new magnificent classrooms in the Denver Tech Center. Unfortunately, <laughs> that lease has not come back from the landlord. And since I've already had the experience on two previous occasions of announcing what I thought were firm deals that the landlord didn't get around to signing, I'm not going to make that announcement, although I have every reason to believe that we will have signatures on it and be ready to announce that very shortly and be up and running just, you know, like in two or three weeks. The space is ready. It requires very minimal renovation, so we'll have classrooms in a highly strategic location. Here's the new facility in Grand Junction, which is working out great. And of course, the, the, the most wonderful thing that's happening in Western Colorado is that after four and a half years of praying and seeking regulatory approval, the first 11 students have begun in our nursing program being trained in the spirit of Florence Nightingale, a woman who, when asked, how would you like to be remembered, said, I want to be known as a woman who held nothing back from Jesus Christ. You know, there's, there's so many things happening here that are an encouragement to me, but I want to tell you what is the single most encouraging development, the most encouraging trend that is occurring at CCU right now. And that is the wonderful new faculty and staff members that have joined Colorado Christian University just in the last few months. Now, I'm not in a position this morning to mention every single one of them. But I want to mention a few. I want to mention uh, Dr. Bernie Prokop. Uh, some of you, Bernie, are you in the, the room? This, well, no, he'll be here this afternoon. Bernie has come to us. He's a graduate of uh, the University of Iowa. He's a graduate uh, cum laude of CU. He leads our writing program and the writing laboratory. If you want to give yourself uh, sort of a sprained wrist, try to pick up uh, Dr. Phil Mitchell's CV. Uh, he's done it all. He has a, a doctorate from the University of Colorado, stayed on there to teach for about 20 years, got rave reviews from students and colleagues. He's active in pastoral min ministry. We consider ourselves very, very fortunate to have Dr. Phil Mitchell joining us. Uh, Diane Bedzinski, who has served us with distinction as an affiliate faculty member, has now joined our regular full-time faculty, and we are extremely glad to welcome her. Dr. Cam Wold, known to many of you in the room, has an MBA in finance from USC, a master's from Golden Gate Baptist Seminary, and a doctorate in education from the University of Idaho. As the Dean of Academic Affairs for the College of Adult and Graduate Studies, Cam is leading the effort to renew our syllabi, raising the bar, caring for faculty members, and setting a new standard of excellence in CAGS. Dr. Bush White comes to us from the Colorado Department of Education and brings a, a distinguished and wonderful career as a teacher and as a principal. 
He is now the Assistant Dean for Education and Licensing in the College of Adult and Graduate Studies. There is a group of uh, advanced writing students who is very, very fortunate to be meeting with Ken Geyer, a new affiliate faculty member. He's a graduate of Texas Christian and Dallas Seminary, and he's written a lot of books. I mean, he has written more books than most people have read. <laughs> Seven of his books have won silver medals. His, uh, one of his books was named the Campus Book of the Year. Two of his books have won gold medals. Uh, we're just thrilled to have somebody who can go into a classroom of aspiring writers and say, this is how you do it, and by the way, this is how you get it published. And then there is a lady who was called to the nursing profession when her son, Connor, contracted a brain tumor. Caring for him, she realized that God was calling her to be a nurse. And so she went back to school to get her BSN and ultimately became a level three trauma nurse at Children's Hospital. We are very happy to welcome, just within the last few days, our Director of Health Services, Stacy White. New vitality, new energy in the uh, development operation, Dick Layton, who at one point ran the Yellow Pages operation for U.S. West. He was the Chief uh, Technology, uh, Chief, Chief Information Officer for uh, U.S. West as well. He was a consultant. He's done a lot of things, and he's really cutting a wide swath in the development area. Mark Clibby also comes out of the business world. He was general manager of a chain of retail stores. We're sure glad to have Mark. Now, Jim Kirk, James Kirk, is not related to the captain of the Starship <laughs> Enterprise. But it is a fact that he is going places where no man has gone before <laughs> in pursuit of philanthropic support for Colorado Christian University. Marilyn Spittler is doing a wonderful job managing our facilities and, and uh, conferences. Dr. Melanie Day comes to us as the Assistant Dean of Business and Technology for CAGS. And before joining the university, Melanie was CFO of a media company, development manager for Nova University, a business consultant, chair of the graduate business programs of Schiller International University of Heidelberg. Let me tell you this, you can expect great, great things from our MBA program. Rick Garris joins us from a wonderful ministry, one of the greatest ministries in the world, Compassion International, where he was director of compensation, benefits, and employment. As you know, uh, he is the uh, director of HR for CCU. He is making a huge contribution to the future of this university. Dr. Bruce Pellin, director of our Macy program, director of faculty development as well for CAGS. He has two masters and a PhD in adult learning and instruction technology. He is renowned as an author and speaker. Our new athletic director, Darren Ritchie, a man of God, a man of basketball, a man who loves students. It's gonna be a lot of fun to have him leading our athletic program. David Geyer joined us just a few weeks ago. David, are you in the room here someplace? He's probably on the phone. Uh, I guess uh, two months ago, three months ago, uh, Dick, well, I can tell you some things about David. He comes to us from Indiana Wesleyan. He was director of corporate development. He has been a campus director for InterVarsity, a pastor, faculty member, consultant. And after lunching with him, I can tell you that he has the eye of the tiger. And I predict that we're all going to have to fasten our seatbelt to keep up with Dr. Barbara White. In just a couple of weeks here at CCU, Barbara White, Dr. Barbara White, who is our AVP for Health Professions, has impressed all of us who have come to know her with her expertise, her professionalism, her enthusiasm, her love of Jesus, and her spizzerinctum. And after this meeting, Go and meet Barbara and ask her, what does spizzerinctum mean? <laughs> now, I haven't mentioned everybody. I've mentioned a few. But part of, the, part of the sign of a great university is its ability to attract great people. Now, everyone I've mentioned is not in the room because some of their names start with a, I don't know, L through Z or whatever it is. But may I ask everyone, whether I've mentioned your name in the last few minutes or not, who has been who has joined this university within the last 24 months to just please rise and let us take a, take a look at you. Just stand up. And, and for those of you who were not mentioned this morning, smile 
you may be on candid camera. <laughs> now, I want to ask everyone in the room who has been part of Colorado Christian University for more than two years to please stand up. Would you stand up and just let us look at you? OK, now, remain standing. May I ask everyone who has been here more than five years to remain standing? If you've been here at CCU more than five years to remain standing? How about more than 10 years? <laughs> How many years? 12 years. Alan? 31. 31 years. How many years? 11 years. 16. 16 years, and you're just getting started. Great. Sana? 13. 13 years. 10 and a half. 10 and a half. <laughs> Cherry? Well, you're with the TV company. I was going to ask you how many years. Where is that back there? Eleven, Eleven, Eleven years. Ten. Jim. Thirteen. Thirteen for Jim McCormick. Ten and a half. Ten and a half. Sixteen. Sixteen. And Frank, I know it's thirty-two. Uh, not that old. Twenty-six. Twenty-six. <laughs> Time passes quickly when you're having fun. I want to just just pause and Lee, Lee McDowell, the vice chairman of the board of trustees, is here this morning. Would you just uh, rise for a moment and say a word of, of thanks and a word of encouragement to the Lord about our wonderful faculty and staff? I would be happy to. Father, there is so much we have heard this morning that our hearts may be just filled and overflowing with gratitude for the work that you have done and the work you are doing through this university. But right now, Lord, I thank you for the great people you have brought to CCU. Lord, I thank you for their commitment to you, first and foremost. And Lord, may their commitment always be to you first, despite the many demands of their work here and life in general. But Lord, may you enable them in this place to utilize their strengths, their gifts, their talents, and hearts filled with the fruit of the Spirit that overflow, overflows to each other and to the students and to the community that we've been charged to impact and influence for your glory and for the kingdom of God. It's with thanksgiving that we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, amen. Amen and amen. My, my prayer for all the members of the faculty is my favorite verse from the Old Testament, sort of a life verse for me. And I pray that as you invest your lives in our students, in the great cause that we're united in, in this university, that as you wait upon the Lord, your strength will be renewed that you will mount up with wings like eagles, that you will run and not grow weary, that you will walk and not grow, faint, not grow faint. Now then the future, which brings us to Issachar. I personally think Issachar gets kind of a raw deal. I mean, you never hear much about Issachar. Bill Ritter and George Bush and all of those guys are in the, in the paper every day, and I haven't seen Issachar in the paper in forever. I mean, it just doesn't come up. What do we know about Issachar? Sid, what do we know about Issachar? Yes, sons. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's a professor, folks. <laughs> you know, the thing about Issachar that I find fascinating is, you remember this appears in a listing of the, of the tribes that were getting ready to go to war. And it told how many warriors there were in one tribe and this, that, and the other thing about the other. But when they got to Issachar, the scripture says these were men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Or in another translation, it said men who understood the times and knew what the best course of action would be for Israel, knew, knew the course of action that Israel should take. You know what I'm wondering as we gather here this morning, when they write the history of Colorado Christian University, and by the way, that project is underway. It has begun, and so you may be hearing from someone quite soon who I have uh, commissioned to write the history of CCU, 
leading up to the 100th anniversary of the university seven years from now, but we're, we're getting a good head start on that. But when they write the history, do you suppose they will say the men and women of Colorado Christian University understood the times that we live in? I must say to you most earnestly, we have to understand these times. We have to know what's going on in the world. We have to be relevant to what's going on in the world. But more than just understanding the times, we need to redeem the times. This wonderful passage out of Ephesians, I think, is a call on the life of this university like almost nothing else. We are called to make the most of our opportunities. Or in another translation, it says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now, what I think is so extraordinarily interesting about this is it does not say redeem the times or make the most of your opportunities in spite of the fact that you live in wicked times. It doesn't say that. It says because the days are evil. I take that to mean that the measure of God's call on us to redeem the times is exactly because the days are evil. You think we live in wicked times? How many here think we live in wicked times? I do. I mean, I don't, I'm not saying this is the worst time in the history of the world. There have been lots of times when there was depravity and drunkenness and immorality. This may not be the worst time, I don't know. But it is a very, very bad time. I want to talk to you about the times. According to the eminent historian, Paul Johnson, the modern world began on May 29th, 1919. Who can tell me what occurred on that day that made him think that the world, the modern world began on that day. Don't everybody talk at once. Was Dr. Mitchell. It, was it Einstein? Absolutely. It, 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 it was Einstein. It was Albert Einstein. Because on that date, May 29th, 1919, certain photographs were taken uh, on an island off the west coast of Africa and in Brazil that proved to the world's satisfaction Einstein's theory of relativity. Now, he'd begun working on this as a 26-year-old uh, clerk in the Swiss patent office uh, as early as 1905. And he promulgated his special theory of relativity and then continued to work on this. Even through World War I, he worked on it, trying to develop a theory which he believed would overturn Newtonian physics. And in 1914 or 1915, he succeeded in doing this. But Albert Einstein himself said that it should not be accepted as proven until certain empirical tests would verify his theory of relativity. Like Samson, he let his hair grow very long. <laughs> in fact, someone who saw a preview of this picture said that it shows, in addition to everything else, what happens to your hair if you stick your finger in the electric socket. <laughs> this was a breathtaking scientific breakthrough. I mean, as the general theory of relativity was accepted, even by people who don't understand it, and I'm not one of those who really understands it. I don't understand it. But I know this much about it. What it proves is that time and space are not absolute. That under certain circumstances, time and space are relative measures. And this caught the, the imagination of people in the 20s and 30s in a way that is hard for us to imagine today. I mean, it was just shocking. It really did overthrow the idea of the Newtonian physics, which everybody just took for granted. And what came along with that was encouragement for a, a concept that had been around for a long time but never very popular. It, it led to encouraging the idea of moral relativism. Now, moral relativism had been, been kicking around for more than two millennia. The idea that there are no moral or ethical absolutes, that there are no absolute rights and wrongs. Been around a long time. Uh, Protagoras probably is one of the earliest proponents of this idea. He said, man is the measure of all things. Not moral absolutes, but man is the measure of all things. And of course, there were thinkers throughout the centuries that, that believed right and wrong depend on social convention. That's what Herodotus believed. That's what uh, Spinoza believed. Uh, David Hume made the point that morality has no objective 
basis. But these ideas, they really never caught on. They were there, but they were not mainstream ideas up until about the early days of the 20th century. It's not that everybody agreed what constituted right and wrong. There was lots of dispute about that. But nobody doubted particularly that there was such a thing. It's as if we were going to go to Pittsburgh. And uh, Jim Howard says, well, let's drive to Pittsburgh. And uh, Lee said, no, let's take a, a Hertz rent-a-car. And somebody else said, let's take the train. And somebody else said, let's fly there. Somebody else said, well, let's set out to the west coast and fly around the world and, and approach Pittsburgh from the east. A lot of differences of opinion, but nobody doubts that Pittsburgh is there. Well, up until the 20th century, there were very, very few people who really doubted that there was some such thing as absolute truth, as absolute right and wrong. But as the 20th century unfolded, uh, writers like uh, Nietzsche, Freud, Edward Westermark, the uh, emotivists, Karl Marx, uh, John Paul Sartre, Dr. Uh, Margaret Mead, the Kinsey Report, Dr. Ruth, Dr. Hugh Hefner, <laughs> Dr. Larry Flint, HBO. These people, and a lot of others, encourage this notion that morality is relative, that it is not absolute. Now, of course, this is a, this is a concept, an idea which has come into prominence, has really become into vogue during the 20th century, which, which is completely the opposite of what the Bible teaches. And of course, it has entered the thought life of, of most Americans, even of a great many Christians, much to our disadvantage. Of course, Hollywood loved it. Oh, John Dewey loved it. John Dewey was perhaps the foremost advocate of this idea of uh, moral relativism. Hollywood loved it because there weren't any more restrictions. If there's no, no absolute right and wrong, that means you could have all the nudity you want, all the vulgarity you want, all the uh, violence you want, and nobody to say you shouldn't. Even churches found that it was convenient to think about relative moral values and absolute. The Bible came under attack. But probably no place in our country did the notion of moral relativism find a more fertile breeding ground than on the campuses of colleges and universities, particularly some of those that are the most famous. Moral relativism and its malevolent cousins, value relativism, cultural relativism, secularism, hedonism, materialism, socialism, and all the rest. I mean, it was so trendy. It was so popular. It was so convenient. As Alan Bloom pointed out, it provided a great release from the tyranny of good and evil with their cargo of shame and guilt and the endless effort to pursue the one and the avoidance of the other. Intractable good and evil causes infinite distress, which is almost instantly relieved when more flexible values are introduced. Flexible values indeed. Sex week at Yale. Naked parties at Yale, Wesley, and Brown, MIT. X-rated student publications at a lot of colleges and universities. Co-ed dorms almost everywhere. And in many colleges and universities, they began to teach that Jesus is a joke, the Bible is irrelevant, Islamic terrorists are freedom fighters, socialism is a humane economic policy, they blame America first, and they think homosexuality is a valid alternative lifestyle. In fact, they even have lavender graduation ceremonies at a lot of, of uh, important, high prestige colleges and universities so that if you're a homosexual, you get a separate graduation. When I met with the uh, CUS faculty a few days ago, I showed this slide, which is out of the Chronicle of Higher Education. And it tells that there are now three openly, avowedly homosexual college presidents. Well, in the next issue, this was three weeks ago or something, in the very next issue of the Chronicle of Higher Education, there's a story that said that they'd gotten a lot of mail from uh, people around the country saying, well, wait a minute, what about me? And so the story shows that three was the wrong number, that there are now at least 13 college and university presidents who are advertising their homosexuality. Now, somebody is thinking, this is not a very well-balanced picture of America. I've just been given the bad news. Obviously, that is true. What I've just said in the last few minutes does not constitute a well-balanced picture of life in America. 
We're still a land of incredible freedom, and from our freedom to publish, to worship or not to worship if that's our choice, but our freedom to publish, to travel, uh, to do all of the things that uh, we take for granted as freedom has given us an opportunity to get rich, and in fact, America is rich. Today, our per capita income is approximately 200 times that of the poorest nations. In this country, even poor people live like the middle class in most of the world. Poor people, I mean people who are living below the officially defined poverty line, have medical care, cars, color television. 46%, believe it or not, of people who live below the government established poverty line in this country, 46% own their own homes. There's been a revolution in communication in the last few decades. In the last century, in the century before last, uh, one of my distant ancestors helped to start the Pony Express so that letters could be sent coast to coast in the incredible, breathtaking speed of 10 days. Today, school children, even preschool children, are sending emails and text messages around the world at the speed of light. There's been a revolution in transportation. You know, it wasn't very many years ago, I mean, not just within our lifetime, but, but not too long ago, that most people never in their whole life traveled any distance from their own home. A lot of people never got more than 100 miles from their home, many of them not 50, lots of them not 15 miles. Today, we just go around the world and don't think about it. As a result of progress in medicine, in science, in technology, there's been a huge increase in life expectancy. The av average American life expectancy has increased 50% in the last 100 years. That of minority people has doubled. And even now, despite all the terrible things I told you were happening to the thought life of our country, and, and it is terrible, America remains the country envisioned by Catherine Lee Bates when she came down off of Pike's Peak and wrote America the Beautiful. And she wrote, God shed his grace on thee. According to Barner's research, 58% of Americans consider themselves to be deeply spiritual. Four out of 10 adults say they are evangelical Christians. 45% claim to be born again. 53% are theologically conservative. 48% agree that the Bible is totally accurate. And 86% of Americans are concerned about the moral condition of their country. I agree with Ruth Graham who said, if God does not soon judge America, he's going to owe an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah. We've got a mess on our hands, and so these are the times we live in. Great things happening, but also a darker side. Broken families, abortion, drugs, pornography, big government, racism, persecution of the Boy Scouts, sexual deviancy, authoritarian government, an imperial, an imperial judiciary, terrorism, energy and environmental issue, corruption in politics, we need the favorable year of the Lord. We need a favorable decade of the Lord. We need a century of the Lord's favor so that we can train up and call forth and inspire and motivate and sustain a generation of men and women of outstanding leadership ability, passionate about Jesus Christ, who will be so well educated, who will be so charismatic that they will be the natural leaders of churches, government, businesses, and the universities of the future. This is the noble task to which Colorado Christian University is called, is to summon and inspire and educate that generation of leaders. Leaders who will lift up Jesus Christ as the hope of the world. Socrates asked, how can we know a line is crooked if we have no straight line to set next to it? My dear friends, I am convinced it is the task, the mission of Colorado Christian University to be the straight line. Now I know that in being the straight line of saying there are moral absolutes, here's what's right and here's what's wrong, and we are respectfully, to say to our fellow citizens, we are respectfully sure of these facts. That makes us the straight line, not necessarily popular, not necessarily easy, certainly is not. That's part of what CCU is called to do. But most of all, we are called to be the salt of the earth. Now, why did Jesus tell his followers that they were the salt of the earth? I mean, I'll approach this very cautiously because there are eminent theologians in the room who know a lot more about it than I do, but 
He didn't say you're going to be the nutmeg of the earth or the paprika of the earth or the olive oil of the earth or the gold of the earth or the diamonds of the earth. He said you're going to be the salt of the earth. Now, why do you suppose that is? First of all, it was a great compliment because at that time, salt was a tremendously precious, valuable commodity. But that wasn't the reason, I think, why our Lord used that expression. It was because salt has the power to cure decadence. And in fact, actually, uh, I'm told that salt in early days was actually used in large quantities to cure certain kinds of, of illnesses. But that's not, I think, what he had in mind. I think what he had in mind was the preservative power. Now, we live in a, in a decadent, decaying, corrupting society. I believe that we are called to be the salt of the earth and to provide the antidote for the infection, for the corruption that we have in America today. This brings me to the series of strategic objectives workshops which are coming up. The next one's on October 19th. And uh, I am indebted to uh, Ryan Hartwig for a great idea which I haven't yet taken him up on, but I'm going to by the time of the October 19th <coughs> workshop. We're going to put together a little document that shows how our vision and mission statement and strategic objectives fit together. Because far from being in conflict, they fit together seamlessly. But in the next several months, we're going to look at each of several of this university's strategic objectives and really get our heads around them, have a chance to look at them seriously, to contemplate them, and, and to really understand what they mean and what their implications are. Obviously, one of our most important strategic objectives is to teach students to trust the Bible. Now, in an age of moral relativism, it is only natural, only natural, that the Bible would be treated as tentative, provisional, subject to criticism, probably wrong, maybe wrong as much as it's right, only natural that that would happen. In his great new book, The Truth War, John MacArthur writes, spiritual terrorists and saboteurs within the church pose a far more serious threat than manifestly hostile forces outside the church. I believe that that is correct. Well, on October 19th, Dr. Don Sweeting and Brian Bissell will lead a uh, workshop on teaching students to trust the Bible. Uh, I think you all know uh, Brian, but let me tell you about uh, Dr. Don Sweeting, a member of the CCU Board of Trustees. He is the senior pastor of Cherry Creek Presbyterian Church, a graduate of Lawrence University, Oxford, and Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He is chairman of the Theology Committee of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, the author of two books and of numerous articles. Don and Brian are passionate about the veracity of the Bible. It's going to be a great session on October 19th. We're going to teach students to live holy lives. I happen to have known Dr. Charles Malik. He, he passed away several years ago, a number of years ago. He was a great statesman. He was a great scholar. Uh, he was awarded honorary degrees from more than 50 universities around the world. He represented his country in the United Nations, presided over the UN General Assembly, presided over the UN Security Council and spent much of his last years telling people about Jesus Christ. And I was profoundly touched by his explanation of the world as he saw it then. Now, this was a number of years ago, even before all of these trends of moral relativism had really played out. And he made this point, the world is dying before our eyes, and only Jesus Christ can save it. Only the risen Christ can bring it back to earth, bring it back to life again. He's not wrong about that. In America, we believe 43% of American marriages will end in divorce. Last year, 37% of all births were to unmarried women, two-thirds uh, among minority uh, women, 50 million abortions in the United States since Roe versus Wade. Every day, worldwide, 126,000 abortions, 19, almost 20 million Americans use illegal drugs. Pornography is a bigger industry today than all of pro sports combined, football, basketball, baseball, rugby, you name it. Moral relativism in America has infected our thought life to the extent that today, 45% of Americans say abortion is morally acceptable. 30% say homosexuality is okay. Americans approve by a margin of 38% looking at nudity. 36% say using profanity is okay, and 35% say getting drunk is all right. Uh, how many in the room uh, subscribe to USA Today? Anybody? 
decoupled. This is an article out of yesterday's paper, yesterday's paper. Some of you remember Will Rogers who used to say, I only know what I read in the newspaper. Well, I wouldn't want to tell you that, but here's, a, here's an article that just tells how far this trend has gone. Should homosexuality be considered an acceptable alternative lifestyle? In 1982, when that question was asked, 34% of Americans said yes, it was an acceptable lifestyle. In 2007, the same question was asked, and that number is now 48%. Do you approve or disapprove of men and women living together without being married? In 86, that number was 43%. Today, it is 79%. Desperate, uh, desperate times in America. This is a moment we really need to redouble our efforts to teach students to live holy lives. Well, Jim McCormick, Heidi Ross, Scott Werner, and Joni DeBrito are going to do that in a, in a uh, strategic objective seminar that will be coming up shortly. Here is something that is so close to my heart, I can't tell you, to teach students to be evangelists. Uh, incredibly, I'm a university president. Prior to that, uh, I was, had a life in politics. Uh, I've been a businessman all my life. But God's real call on my life is evangelism. Very, uh, actually, a very strange the way that turned out. And I'll tell you about it sometime. Because I'm the least likely person to become an evangelist, and yet that's what he's called me to do. And I think he calls all of us to do that. He has called us to make disciples of all nations. He has called us to be accountable for our faith. And you know, the reality is that very few people are effective in evangelism. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. 100 million unchurched Americans, 4.3 billion unsaved persons worldwide, and I am absolutely convinced that the vast majority of Christians never in their whole life lead even one person to Jesus Christ. And, and I have no data to back this up. I actually believe that that is true of a great many pastors as well. We've got a huge job to do. Scott Werner, Kevin Turner, David Bosworth, and Dave Daniels are going to talk to us about how CCU our student, our faculty, our staff can be more effective as evangelists in our classrooms, in Jefferson County, in cyberspace, and throughout the world. The harvest is great. The laborers are few. We need to lead the way. We want to be a magnet for outstanding students. We are a magnet for good students right now. In fact, if, if, if you look at those peaks, that reflects our SAT scores. They're pretty good, nothing to, nothing to apologize for in the slightest. Our ACT and SAT scores compare well with UNC, CSU, uh, XYZ, I don't know. We're, we're, not, we're not up to uh, CU Boulder, but we beat CU in other areas, Colorado Springs and Denver. Uh, we have nothing to, to, to be bashful about in our present ACT and SAT scores of incoming students. We want to do better. We want to bring uh, more and more very well qualified, very intellectually accomplished young men and women to uh, Colorado Christian University. Ron Rex, Dick Crombie, Mike Maroney, and Gary Ewan are going to lead this workshop. It's going to focus not only on the nuts and bolts of how we bring people to the university and what every one of you can do, because every member of our faculty and staff can have a huge role in recruiting students the right kind of students, students who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who are ambitious, who are intellectually accomplished, who want to change the world, we can have a big, big impact on that. And one of the things that I've asked Gary Ewan to do as a part of this uh, seminar is to elaborate on some themes I first heard him express a year ago to help us understand this millennial postmodern generation. Now that is not to say that we have to agree with them, it means we have to understand them in order to do our job. We're going to teach students to write effectively. You know I'm very excited about that. Dr. Janet Black and Dr. Bernie Prokop will be uh, giving us a rundown on how we're going to do that and the implications of it. Now, one of the things that many of you have heard me refer to repeatedly is that a biblical view of human nature leads to a natural preference for limited government. We're not letting government get too big. 
James Madison wrote that if men were angels, there would be no need for government. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. But of course, our founding fathers realized men are not angels. We have to have government to keep us from abusing each other, exploiting each other, killing each other, stealing from each other. The question is how much government? How much government is the right amount? George Washington put it well. He said, government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is a force, and like fire, a dangerous servant and a fearful master. Thomas Jefferson believes, well, Lord Acton first, the great uh, historian of liberty, made the point that, that people in power tend to put their own interests first. And he said, power corrupts, absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. Jefferson believed that the government which governs best governs least. Woodrow Wilson said the history of liberty is the limitation of government. And Barry Goldwater, a great but somewhat misunderstood leader of our country, in whose chair I sat for several years after he departed from the United States Senate, said the government that's big enough to give you everything you want is big enough to take everything you've got. Well, we're going to ask Jeff Mallinson, Bill Mesa, Dennis Jacobson, and Ryan Hartwig to talk to us about that. A tremendously important subject. And if you think about it, if we're serious about educating leaders, men and women who will go out to lead our churches, our businesses, who will be congressmen, senators, moms and dads, this is one of the big issues they need to deal with and we need to get them prepared to do it. Tamara Broad and Sid Buzzle will be talking to us about free markets, why free markets mean prosperity and human freedom, why regimented markets mean human misery and economic stagnation. Now, some people think the U.S. Constitution has been hijacked. I happen to be one of them. So does Chuck Colson think that. George Will thinks that. Professor Russell Hittinger thinks that. And a lot of scholars believe that. Many of us believe the Supreme Court's abusing its power. Some have written that there's been a judicial coup d'etat. Is this true? I think it is, by the way. But that's something I would ask you to think about as you hear our seminar on this subject. And if it's true, what are the consequences for us as citizens, as a university, and as followers of Jesus Christ? And the abuse of power by our judiciary has enormous and very imminent, very imminent implications for this university. And I don't mean 25 years from now or two years from now. I mean today, right now. Chuck King, who is learned in the law, will lead uh, an effort to talk to us about that. He's going to take us right to the, to the nexus of this issue. And by the way, whatever happened to Western civilization? Whatever did happen to Western civilization? And for that matter, what is Western civilization? Is Western civilization better than others? Well, I happen to believe that that is true, but I am absolutely convinced that that is a minority point of view on this campus. We need to talk about that. We need to have a real understanding of what Western civilization is about, if it's better. The reason I think it's better is just mainly empirical. I mean, I think the measure of whether Western civilization is better than Islam or the Hindu civilization or Asian civilization is what are the results? And in terms of human freedom, religious tolerance, the rights of women, uh, progress in science, medicine, education, I think we're a superior civilization. I do not think it proves that God loves us any better, certainly not. I do think if it's true that Western civilization and, and our privilege to live in a superior civilization is true, that it gives us certain special responsibilities to share the blessings of Western civilization with others. Not to say there aren't, isn't something we can learn from other civilizations, clearly there is, but, but we need to understand and preserve our heritage. How many in the room remember when Jesse Jackson went out to Stanford in about 1988 and he led the students in chanting, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. We need to start the chant, ho, ho, hey, hey, Western Civ is here to stay. This is crucial. Does Western civilization have its fault? You bet it does. And we need to be conscious of them. We need to be prepared not only to defend Western civilization, but also to reform it. How does it compare with others? I mentioned the, uh, the rights of women. I mean, when people tell me, I, I just can't believe it. I've had students on this campus say that they just can't see why we're, we're superior to other civilizations. And I ask them how much they know. I had a young woman tell me that not very long ago. I said, well, how much do you actually know about how women, for example, get treated in the Hindu civilization or the Islamic civilization? 
Is Western civilization under attack? You better believe it. What are we going to do about it? Well, we're going to ask Stan Dyke, Bill Watson, and Phil Mitchell to give us the answer to that. And over the course of the next uh, several months, perhaps not within the confines of the next eight or nine months, we're going to talk about all of our strategic objectives and much, much more. Now in a moment I'm going to sum up and uh, then I'd like to ask for your questions. If you have a comment, a question, if anybody wants to make a speech, this would be a good time to do it. We have a good crowd here this morning, so if anybody wants to announce their candidacy for public office, this would certainly be a good uh, opportunity to do that. Uh, after I have summed up in just a moment, if uh, there's anyone who would like to pass out business reply envelopes, you may do that uh, as well. But before I sum up, I do want to tell you that if you've enjoyed the pictures this morning, uh, Paige Burke did all of those on very, very short notice. In a couple of days, she, she not only assembled those photographs, but she actually took quite a, quite a number of them, for which I am thankful. Let me finish up. I hope that you feel the same sense of destiny that I do about the times we live in, about God's call on us to be the salt of the earth, about fulfilling our strategic objectives, to really raise the bar on academics, to grow this university. We are simply not big enough. We are not big enough either in the College of Undergraduate Studies or in the College of Adult and Graduate Studies. We are not at an efficient economic point. We need to be in a very few years at at least 1,500 students in the undergraduate program and I don't have quite as precise a number in mind in the College of Adult and Graduate Studies, but it needs to grow and in fact is growing. Uh, Dick and Mike and the others are really doing a great job of, of getting us growing. We need to strengthen our balance sheet. I mean, the reality is uh, we're not in financial trouble. We were profitable last year, but compared with where we need to be, we're just getting started to build a balance sheet that could weather tough economic times there was a moment not very many years ago when, frankly, a couple of bad enrollment years would have just blown this university out of the water. And some of you uh, have heard of, I don't think anyone here will remember, that back in the 1960s, they couldn't pay the faculty for nine months. They finally did. They finally got some money and paid with interest. But there have been some very precarious times in this university's financial history. We're not in that shape now. We're in, we're in solid shape, but we're not strong enough uh, to build a new campus, and by the way, ask me about that during the Q&A if you'd like to. I'll be happy to bring you up to date on it. We need to strengthen our balance sheet. We need to show the world what it means to follow mm -hmm. Jesus, and I have two things in mind about that. First, I want to appeal to every person in this room to support CCU financially. I have written you about this. It is terribly important. I'm going to nag you to the ends of the earth until you do it. Please, please, please make a financial commitment to support this university. And I understand that for some of you this will be a sacrifice, but we must have it because when, when I sit down, as I did yesterday with a very generous financial supporter of this university, a question that comes up is, well, does your board of trustees, does your board of trustees support the university financially? And I can look them right in the eye and say, absolutely, generously, in many cases sacrificially, 100%. Does your faculty and staff support the university financially? And I can say that last year, 79%, almost 80%, did so. I, I need to be able to say, very soon, I need to be able to say 100%. And so if you have not already done that, if you haven't signed up for payroll deduction or something, and you hear murmuring at your door, that will be a squad of us who will be standing outside your door, praying without ceasing until you, <laughs> until you get signed up. We're going to become a, a university of a national reputation. We're going to do it by no later than October of 2014. And when we do, we're going to give all the glory to Jesus. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have a plan for our lives, that you have a plan for this university, that you sent your son into the world to live and die and teach and be a role model and be persecuted and put to death and rise again for our salvation. Thank you that even though we are outnumbered and outgunned in the media and in the culture, that we know that, uh, that your word is going to prevail, that moral relativism is just a passing phase, and uh, that, that you will not be mocked, that you will not be denied. Lord, I thank you for every man and woman in this room, for their dedication, for their integrity, for the way that they are serving this university and pouring their lives into our students. Thank you for them. Reward them richly for it. In Christ's name, amen.